Hi and welcome back to part two of clinical decision making. Uh, this is Alan Gardner, Senior Lecturer in Advanced Clinical Practice at University of Central Lancashire. And in part two of this short lecture series, we'll be looking at some uh, specific clinical decision making models uh, to support your uh, theoretical understanding of clinical decision making. If you haven't already watched part one, it would definitely be worth looking at, uh, well, watching that before you continue with this. Uh, as we build on the, uh, the definitions of uh, clinical decision making that we've already explored. In this session, we'll be continuing our exploration of clinical decision making, specifically focusing on the two main models used to reach a, a working diagnosis. Um, specifically, we're looking at pattern recognition and hypothesis testing. When we're faced with complex clinical problems, as clinicians, we have to think in three dimensions. Three dimensional thinking is what we refer to uh, when we're considering thinking upon multiple lines. So by this, uh, in clinical terms, what we mean is we have, uh, we have to consider a complex set of symptoms and signs that this data that we get from our patients. So in, in part one, I talked about obtaining the data through our history and our examination. And there's, there's several ways in which we can consider that when you're still learning the process of history taking, the process of interpreting that data. Uh, you might find that you ob obtain the data from your, your patients. So you take, take your history and then you go away and you, you look through the information that you've got and try and make sense of it. And that usually throws up more questions. You, you find that you, you realise, well, I haven't asked about risk factors such as lifestyle risk factors like smoking or alcohol intake or whether or not there's a family history of a particular disease like cardiovascular disease. So then that'll throw up questions that, that you want to answer. So we go back to our patient and ask more questions. Um, and so then this, this allows you to consider, uh, well, is there a risk that the patient has cardiovascular disease or do I actually need to consider some other potential cause of their problem, whether that's breathlessness or, or chest pain, for example. Um, so we're starting to think down multiple lines. More experienced clinicians will be considering this in the moment while they're taking the history. And so they'll, they'll structure their questioning in order to ascertain that information and they're considering the implications of that information. So if a patient has a family history of cardiovascular disease, perhaps they've had a, a father who, who died in their 40s uh, after, after an MI, um, maybe they have some other risk factors that we just mentioned, such as smoking or alcohol, those modifiable risk factors, that, that then increases our suspicion that a chest pain might have a cardiac cause. Whereas if those things aren't present, then that might increase your suspicion of, of it being caused by something else. So we need to then think down other lines that we might consider some of the other questions that we ask in the presence of, of chest pain as an example. So we might want to consider, um, could it be a pain that's actually uh, radiating in the chest from the, the upper abdomen, such as we see that in gastroesophageal reflux disease. So we need to then structure our questioning around uh, risk factors such as high caffeine intake or um, uh, when does the pain come on? Is this the first time they've had it or does it tend to come on after eating? And as I said, that as, as people become more experienced, they tend to focus their thinking and structure their questioning in a certain way that allows them to think down these multiple lines of inquiry uh, all at the same time. But that leaves us thinking, well, how do we actually teach that ability? That Well, it's obviously going to come with practice, but there's there's long ways around to learning something. And then there's there's more efficient ways of learning and starting to, to organize our thoughts. And that's why our um, clinical decision making models can start to to support us in actually learning the this this skill of, of knowledge organization and being aware of our own thought processes and understanding how we how we reach these working diagnoses. It can be quite useful as a novice or beginner in terms of clinical decision making uh, to acknowledge that there's a certain level of uncertainty 
And that level of uncertainty isn't going to isn't going to, to go away entirely. Um, that actually that's inherent within healthcare and within diagnostics that we're always working with a, a certain level of uncertainty. It's just that um, with with experience you become uh, more capable of, of managing that level of uncertainty and more capable of analyzing the and interpreting the data available in order to, to, to maximize the amount of certainty that, that, that you can have in order to, to reach a, a diagnosis. Or as you can see from these slides, I use this term, a working diagnosis. You'll see it referred to as provisional, but actually I prefer the term a working diagnosis just because that, that implies that it's something that, um, that you're continually working on. And I've already mentioned uh, in particular in part one of this three part series, that uh, this process is cyclical, that we continue to, to question, well, is this the, the right diagnosis, especially with, with complex patients? Um, and so we're, we're going back to get more data. As more data becomes available, we interpret it and we question, well, are, are we continuing to go down the right line? If we consider this in terms of three-dimensional thinking that I described earlier, that we've always got these, these several lines of inquiry that we're, we're trying to uh, to go down all at the same time. Uh, th this reference at the bottom of the page here, Barrows and Pickle, this is a fairly old text now, but it's still still very relevant because uh, it's very useful in terms of understanding this level of uncertainty and in terms of uh, learning clinical decision making as a process, uh, their approach can be very useful because they, they write about the importance of understanding a diagnosis in more simplified terms, especially as a, as a beginner. Um, so for example, we, if we stick with the, uh, the chest pain example that I mentioned a couple of slides ago, uh, that you, you may feel that you can't actually reach a, a, a more certain working diagnosis such as myocardial infarction or, or uh, coronary heart disease, that it might be enough to just say, well, my, my level of working diagnosis is that I, I think that this chest pain is originating from a cardiac cause or I think that it's it's originating from a gastrointestinal cause and as a beginner that can be enough and that's a good starting point rather than just taking a bit of a stab in the dark and um, and just trying your best to pin a, di a, a pin a diagnosis on a patient's problems that to actually just be a little bit more broad with the terminology that we use and then aiming to develop and refine that over time it, it, whether that's it, with the same patient or just as you become exposed to more and more presentations being able to actually take those those further steps in order to, to refine your ability to reach a, a safe and more accurate working diagnosis what you can see from this slide is that clinical decision making exists on a spectrum from simple and automated processes that allow you to make a very uh, quick decision based on potentially a small data set, that being a, a small uh, amount of information from your, your patient all the way through to, um, we have this idea of heuristics or rules of thumb. We'll talk about that more in the, uh, in the third of these, these videos. Toward the, the right hand side of the screen on this on this far side of the, the spectrum, we can see then that we've moved from very simple automated processes that allow us to think very intuitively and instinctively, um, accessing information very quickly, uh, all the way to, to, as I say, this, this far end of the spectrum when we're acting more analytically and, and trying to be very aware of the way that we interpret the data available to us in order to, to reach a more evidence-based and structured conclusion. Uh, in reality, clinicians move between and throughout this whole spectrum, depending on whether or not uh, they are familiar with the, the, the type of presentation they're seeing, whether or not they're, they're working in an environment that's natural and comfortable to them. Uh, and, and so, uh, this this bottom part of the, the, the diagram here that actually the, the, these colored circles and then the, the lines beneath them you can view them as two two different um, two different diagrams here I've just put them on the same slide 
So where it says uh, data gathered and we've got an arrow sort of progressing in this downward tra trajectory uh, next to it being diagnostic accuracy in this upward trajectory alongside uh, on the left side of the screen we've got novice through to expert and what this is telling us then that um, we know that early in early in their careers clinicians tend to gather a very comprehensive history uh, and I know for, for myself as I teach history taking I teach a very um, structured and very comprehensive approach to to gathering data uh, that being through a very comprehensive history a very detailed physical examination um, but with this tends to come uh, inexperience and so we know that uh, uh, novices and beginners tend to gather a lot of data but have quite low diagnostic accuracy but as we gain clinical experience and gain exposure to more and more uh, patients in different clinical environments uh, that over time we learn to take a more focused history uh, so it becomes more truncated and more focused on just the pertinent um, parts that as we mentioned earlier when we talked about three-dimensional thinking that with practice we're able to think down multiple lines very rapidly uh, and start to rule out different potential diagnoses based on small amounts of um, uh, data available to us and so as I say that expert clinicians tend to gather a small amount of data that's very focused but that their diagnostic accuracy goes up and so that that is essentially because they're able to move between they, these more simplified or automated um, intuitive processes uh, versus the, uh, the more analytical and deliberate processes that, that tend to be more relied upon by um, beginners. Um, the exception to that being that experts will rely more on the, the more sort of elaborate uh, and analytical um, processes if they're seeing a patient or a presentation that they're unfamiliar with so as, as we see unfamiliar uh, clinical presentations will be more likely to rely on um, what we refer to as hypothesis testing which we'll talk about very shortly. I've just mentioned hypothesis testing and as you can see here we've now got a list of different clinical decision making models. Hypothesis testing or the hypothetico deductive method of reasoning uh, is one of the two that we're going to discuss in this video here. Uh, so shortly we'll be moving on to exploring hypothesis testing in a little more detail and in this video I'll also be exploring pattern recognition. These are the two main models uh, of clinical decision making that I think are used clinically, uh, although realistically I think I've already alluded to this, I think clinicians spend time between pattern recognition and hypothesis testing um, depending on the, the clinical scenario that they're involved in. In part three we'll also be looking at algorithm, inductive versus deductive reasoning and heuristics. Hypothetical deductive method then, the uh, this involves the formation of hypotheses and by this we mean that you add a, a weight to your argument. So a hypothesis then is essentially a, a theory or a theoretical idea as to what a, um, in this context, what a, a, a diagnosis is likely to be. Um, so we have this, this deductive form of reasoning then that means that we, we gather a broad set of data. So in this context, we're gathering data from our history and for our from our examination with the potential for getting information from additional tests such as x-rays or laboratory testing. Um, and so this, this broad data set then allows us to narrow down our conclusions to form, a, 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 in this case, a, a a, a, usually a short list of differential diagnoses. Now the, the criticisms of this method is that it becomes exhaustive and exhausting and so people will argue that actually um, our hypothesis testing is is picking from a, a list of say the, the, the 50 causes of um, chest pain or the, uh, or, or the 25 causes of sore throat and so how do we then really add argue, uh, weight to our argument to say well I can choose the one most likely of those 
So you might say, well, really, do, do people just tend to kind of find the one that fits best um, and go with that rather than actually finding the the, 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 the true or, or, or more accurate diagnosis. And so that, that's some of the, the criticisms of this, that it's a very long winded approach that we we gather a lot of data and from it we, we tend to, well, we need to, to rule out certain um, diagnoses. Um, so I'm kind of getting ahead of myself a little bit here. So what, what do we really mean by that? So, so we, we get our history and, and examination information and from it, we can form a short list of likely conditions that um, that it says here that, that fit the patient's presentation. Now, that's again, that's kind of a criticism of this, that we're trying to to fit um, certain conditions to what our patient has. So essentially what we're trying to do is actually just observe our patient. And we get we we gain the data from them and start to understand their their lived experience of their disease. And then we're asking ourselves, well, well, what what clinical picture does that actually build up? And so how do I actually add weight to my argument as to what I think the problem is that we should be forming these these evidence based lists of, uh, of differential diagnoses? So I'm going to start. I'm going to stick with our, our example from previously that we use chest pain as an example. So we have a patient that says they have um, a, a new onset of chest pain that it, it started maybe an hour ago and that it's quite intense that we need to know where the location is so they might tell us that it's a central chest pain that's crushing in nature and that they have some um, some shortness of breath with it so we can use that information to form this this list of differential diagnoses so we know that probably at the top of our list is going to be myocardial infarction but the hypothetical deductive method of reasoning says well we've got to also question that and think well what else might be a, a, a potential answer to this question of well, what's causing this patient's chest pain? And so we might add to that some some other cardiac causes that cause uh, that, that, that uh, produce chest pain. So we might also consider um, anxiety or acute pericarditis. We might consider um, aortic dissection uh, or even some some other uh, non-cardiac causes uh, to potentially add, add to our list of differential diagnoses there so I mentioned earlier gastroesophageal reflux disease um, it might be um, a, a pneumonia as well that can, can contribute to, to chest pain so our hypothesis testing then that, that although we can refer to this as a hypothetical deductive method or, or, or hypothesis testing. So we then start to actually test these hypotheses. So we've now got a list of, say, um, five potential conditions. And so we, we go back to our patient and we ask them more questions about their history that start to help us rule out some of the uh, the, the specifics that are associated with, uh, with these um, uh, the, these various conditions until we're, we're more confident that we've been able to, to rule in our working diagnosis and rule out those other potential conditions. And as, as I'm talking, uh, uh, you can probably get a feel for this being quite a, a long winded process that has its limitations, especially when we consider, I mean, we're talking about this in terms of chest pain, that, uh, that if someone's having an MI, a uh, myocardial infarction, then that's a that's a medical emergency. And so that's probably quite a, a good example to use because we start thinking, well, how, how can we inform, how can we a, a apply this very sort of long winded approach to clinical decision making in uh, an emergency scenario? Do we actually need to, to, to use more sort of uh, focused thought processes? And that's what we'll get onto in a moment when we think about pattern recognition. Um, one, one of the limitations of, of both of these methods is that it relies upon our our extensive clinical knowledge. And so, again, this this causes a problem for um, for beginners because we need to actually build up our own uh, clinical information. So we need to understand uh, patterns of disease and what what presentations look like. And so we go back to these these principles. Um, from uh, William Osler that we talked about in part one of this um, uh, this series that he, he stressed the importance of understanding patterns and presentations of disease and understanding well, what what does a patient look like and 
Um, so, say, for example, a patient with chest pain as a result of myocardial infarction, what, what does that patient look like and what do they present with? But he also knew the importance of understanding the theoretical underpinnings of, of disease presentation and disease progression as well. So these two things um, really come hand in hand that we need to understand the thought processes um, that actually allow us to interpret that information, which is what we're talking about with regard to clinical decision making. We also need to develop our background clinical knowledge that underpins that, so understanding presentation of disease. And although that will come from, from reading around the diseases, it also comes from exposing yourself to various clinical presentations and clinical scenarios in order to gain that experience and to, to reflect on it and to learn from it. Moving on, here we have pattern recognition. And this is the term that we use for our method of forming a diagnosis based on, uh, well, patterns of presentation. So it's essentially exactly what it sounds like, that we start to, to recognize um, that uh, certain conditions present in similar ways. We've already mentioned this idea of of chest pain and myocardial infarction, that it, we know that patients present in a particular way, that they tend to be pale and clammy and that they have a, a central crushing chest pain. Um, and so, so we, we learn to recognize these patterns as we gain more clinical um, experience. Also, we know that certain, um, certain conditions are more common than others, so we're exposed to them more frequently. And it's with this experience that we're able to, to more rapidly access um, knowledge that we're, we're familiar with, that we're, we're familiar with particular situations and we, and we see these presentations uh, more frequently. Um, so it, it's most likely then that experienced clinicians um, use pattern recognition more frequently and that they'll only really rely on hypothesis testing um, when they are faced with a, a difficult case or, or something that they're unfamiliar with or if they're, they're working in a new environment. Um, one of the common criticisms of pattern recognition is that people might say that it's, it's intellectually lazy. Um, you, you can argue that actually that, that's not true, that it's actually, um, it's just based on rapidly accessible information. But really one of the, one of the main issues actually is that if we rely too heavily on, on pattern recognition, that it can be quite difficult to unpick our thought processes because they're, they're so automated and intuitive that actually if we were if we were challenged on our thoughts that or, or, our, or our diagnosis that we then have to kind of unpick our our um, our processes now this 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 method of, of um, clinical decision making is really useful in um, high pressure environments where we're seeing high like a quite high flow of patients or, or high turnaround of patients such as uh, medical assessment units or, or emergency departments where you'll be seeing similar presentations over and over again. Um, but one of the risks there is that we fail to recognize when there's an, an outlier. So if we're not aware, if we're, if we're unaware that um, various different diseases can manifest in similar ways, so we might be used to seeing patients with shortness of breath and it being a community acquired pneumonia. But what about the one time that we um, fail to recognize this as being a, a pulmonary embolism because they're, they're, we're going to see those less frequently. Um, and so, so pulmonary embolism and um, community acquired pneumonia may be uh, differential diagnoses of each other. So we need to consider the possibility that one might masquerade as the other one. Um, and so if, if we're only too reliant on pattern recognition, there's, a, there's potential to, to miss that. So you may have heard the expression that we hear hooves, we think horses, but every now and again it's a zebra. Uh, so that probably sounds just like a, like a funny thing, but actually when, when, when you consider what that means is that, uh, well, we hear hooves, so we're used to seeing patients with shortness of breath, and we're used to that being um, a community acquired pneumonia, for example, every now and again, the zebra could be a pulmonary embolism. And it's quite well documented that um, 
that as a, as a healthcare system, it's easy to, to miss a pulmonary embolism and, and, and diagnose it inappropriately. But that in itself can be quite, uh, quite well, very dangerous for the patient. Um, so we need to be aware of when we're using pattern recognition. I'll talk about that in the final slide as well, that actually our, our, our role now is to, to become aware and, and reflective of our thought processes and think, well, am I relying on recognising patterns or am I relying on um, hypothesis testing, which we've already discussed? We now have the uh, opportunity to actually apply some of this thinking. Um, so we have a, a clinical example and what I'd like you to do is pause the video and spend a little bit of time reading this history. So I'm, I'm intentionally presenting this history in the kind of cloud of information that we get from our patients as we, um, as we go through our effective history taking and take a very a comprehensive history. All right, so I'd like you to pause the video and spend some time picking out the pertinent um, bits of information. So in amongst all this kind of cloud data, which parts are actually important and that are going to allow us to, to feed this into one of our um, clinical decision making models. So uh, take, take a few minutes doing that, pause the video and then we can move on to the next slide together. Hopefully you spent some time on the previous slide with the video paused, allowing you to pick out the, uh, the information for yourself before moving on to this slide. As you can see now, I've highlighted in red the information that I think is most pertinent from this, uh, uh, from this case. Uh, so again, you could pause the video and just compare that to, to what you were able to pick out. I start to understand, well, well, why is this important then? So we've got then the, the, the patient's uh, demographic information. We have a 35 year old female um, who thinks she has a chest infection. So I think it's really important that we document the patient's presenting complaint in their own words. Patients tend not to come to us saying, um, I have abdominal pain or um, I, I have shortness of breath. They'll usually put it into their own words. And so we're, we're not um, corrupting the data by writing it down in, in medical terminology because it, a, a patient who tells us that they have um, example like I can't catch my breath if we instantly start to, to transfer that into um, shortness of breath or breathlessness that we're actually starting to, to corrupt that that in the initial data that we get from our patients um, but then Further down the line, it's our job to start to interpret that, but only once we've actually truly uh, understood the patient's meaning of, of, of what they're referring to. Um, so we have the, the onset that we know that it happened, it started three, three months ago, that she's, um, she's got a cough and some breathlessness. Uh, it tends to interrupt her while she's talking uh, and she's rating it at around a five out of 10 for severity. Um, it doesn't tend to change, so it's not intermittent in nature. It doesn't have any specific time of day um, associations. Now, going back to this idea of when to interpret the data in medical terms, and she's, she's said that she's coughing up mucus and that there's sometimes some blood in it. So now is the opportunity to actually um, transfer that into our own like medical terminology. So she has hemoptysis. Um, that we, uh, we know that she has a family history of uh, breast cancer and she's on the combined contraceptive pill um, with a, a significant history of smoking that's gonna uh, increase her risk factors for several diseases. Um, and she has some, some vocal hoarseness as well. Now, in terms of organizing our thoughts on the next slide, we're gonna move on to actually summarizing this a little more succinctly. So now we can see that we've got a, a more succinct summary of this patient. And I, I think that, well, as we get to a couple of slides time, we're going to talk about actually forming good habits and, and organising our thoughts and organising the information that we have in order to, to make it easier for us to interpret this. So we've already gone from this cloud of data that we've got, that, that, that's kind of our raw data from our, our patient. And now we've started to actually 
refine this and make it easier, more, more manageable, basically. It's, it's easier for us to, to use, and it's a more manageable data set that we've, we've picked out the most important parts. And from this, we can start to feed this into our clinical decision-making models. Now, some of you may have read that case and instantly recognized a pattern. However, I've intentionally used a, um, a history based on a patient that I've seen in, in practice previously. Um, but it, it intentionally, it's it's not entirely clear cut. I think that there's probably going to be um, one particular uh, disease at the top of your list of differentials. However, from this information, um, we can start to think, well, uh, uh, do we need to go down several lines of inquiry here? We've talked earlier about our three dimensional thinking and this need to consider uh, different uh, possibilities. Um, even though we might have one thing in mind uh, that we'll get to in the next slide that we think is probably the most likely diagnosis that we might need to consider. Uh, well, what level of uncertainty do we have? And, and is this a lesson in terms of dealing with uncertainty and, and how we actually start to um, develop our diagnostics over a period of time? So if we move on to the next slide, we can now see that We've generated a list of four potential differential diagnoses. Now you might find that actually your list of differential diagnoses was different. And I think that that's inherent to clinical decision making, that it's, it, it has this level of subjectivity that different clinicians are going to see um, different uh, potential differential diagnoses. However, I think that the information that we've refined from our history has allowed us to um, highlight that there's, there's going to be a high suspicion of something serious, that being lung cancer for this patient, um, but there's also a potential need to, to further rule out some of these other causes. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, we can now talk about actually structuring our thoughts and forming these good habits. So it, with the example that we've just seen, we've taken it from uh, that, that raw data that we get from our history taking through to refining it down to our uh, list of differential diagnoses. We didn't actually refine a specific working diagnosis, but we had um, lung cancer at the top of our list. So that's the, the main thing to prioritize, that it's essentially cancer until proven otherwise. Um, now, in terms of forming good habits, uh, we need to actually start vocalizing our thinking. Now that can be as much as um, talk, talking to ourselves essentially if there's no one around to, to, to bounce ideas off but actually getting used to uh, speak, talking through cases and summarizing them in ways that we've just seen in order to help you organize your thoughts but having a, 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 an open discussion with one of your colleagues can be really useful because this allows you to, to, to vocalize your thoughts, to explore your thinking with colleagues, for example your mentor or, um, or other, um, there's always often ACPs, advanced clinical practitioners around or other doctors that you can um, uh, bounce your thoughts off. Um, and this allows you then to not only explore your own thought processes, but to explore theirs in terms of the case as well. So it's, it says here, um, asking other clinicians to explain how they reach the diagnosis, especially if you've got the same information from a patient, but that their thinking is different to yours. Because um, what we need to avoid is a scenario where, um, it, it, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stick with the example of chest pain. If if, you, if every time you see a patient who has chest pain, you guess that it's going to be myocardial infarction, a lot of the time you're going to be right. And so there's a risk that our colleagues and our mentors will say, well done, you've got the answer right, but they don't explore your thought processes. And if you are inclined to just use guesswork, then that, that denies you of the opportunity to actually deconstruct your thought processes and, and learn how to actually more safely and accurately use the information that you've got that does in a way that doesn't rely on guesswork. But for those of you who, who are still, um, who, who are a few steps ahead of that and are already applying more analytical thinking, you can still get to a different uh, working diagnosis to that of your, of your colleagues. And this might be because they've just asked one additional question that kind of 
provides the, the crux of the uh, of the whole case and allows them to, to gain that insight that perhaps you, you never had access to um, or just knowledge of different um, conditions that allows them to to reach a different working diagnosis um, it also mentions here this idea of reflecting in action um, and, and giving you yourself the opportunity to think well am I using pattern recognition now or am I using hypothesis test testing or a bit of both? And if, if you find that you're relying on pattern recognition most of the time, that probably means that you're being exposed to a, a fairly limited set of presentations and, and means that you need to, um, to perhaps engage in more analytical thinking to, to question, well, am I always recognizing patterns appropriately um, or do I need to broaden my clinical exposure so that I'm challenging myself to actually uh, see some some varying clinical presentations um, but this about gets us to the end of this presentation I'm just going to move on to the next slide which is our references again so what we've done in this video then is to look more closely at our two main uh, models of clinical decision making, hypothesis testing and pattern recognition, um, that they're at two kind of different ends of our spectrum of clinical decision making uh, models. Um, but it realistically, as clinicians, we're going to use a little bit of both. But I think the main thing for, for you guys listening to this is to actually just start to pick apart your own uh, thought processes and, and to understand how are you actually approaching your, your ability to form a working diagnosis and start to reflect on your own thought processes and start to, to try to, to put information into some of these, these models that we're looking at at the moment and, and see if that helps you improve your, uh, your diagnostic accuracy. Thank you for listening. Um, you can now move on to part three of this series um, and I will speak to you then.